I think that's what a lot of the incoming folks want. They want purpose-driven work. And when people talk about Gen Z in this capacity, I find it fascinating because to me, it's not just Gen Z. It is now everyone coming out of a post-COVID environment. We really did look deeply at our commitments and where we spend our time and how we want to live our lives. And I think that is ubiquitous across humans. I'm Jim Hessler, and this is Path Forward, Real Conversations About Leadership. In every episode, we're having real conversations with real people about real issues, about the journey, about the challenges, about the joys. One thing leaders believe is that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the challenges, no matter how confusing or difficult things are, there's always a path forward. Leadership is a very creative process if you're doing it well. For the past 21 years, we've been teaching leadership primarily through the process of great conversations. I'm talking today with Maria Colacurcio. She's the CEO of Cindio Solutions. Cindio helps companies analyze and resolve pay and opportunity gaps. So Maria, your company works directly with clients who need to address these issues? Our company helps other companies, typically big companies, Fortune 2000 companies, analyze and resolve pay and opportunity gaps that are due to something like gender, race, or ethnicity. So it's it is obviously an enterprise business-to-business software company. We're VC-backed, meaning it's a for-profit company, but it also has a mission that's deeply personal for me and I think for many of our employees. Why is the mission deeply personal for you? Yeah, it's interesting. My career has been very nonlinear, and I think that's similar to a lot of folks that I know but that you don't hear about often. I think we tend to read about pretty linear career paths, yet there's a bunch of folks sort of embedded into the culture of tech and other industries that have taken a very different path, and that was certainly me. I graduated with a degree in history. I spent time in D.C. working at the Smithsonian, at the National Museum of American History, and really ended up in tech by chance. Mm. It was a random meeting at a dinner party where a woman said, you really got to move to the Bay Area. It was during the tech boom and I was fresh out of college and that sounded like a fun experience. So I did. I moved to the Bay Area and started working at an Israeli-backed startup Mm -hmm. where I learned just a tremendous amount. Most Israelis are former military Mm -hmm. because they have a requirement there to serve. And that really embeds upon the culture, this sense of team over self. And that has been really a consistent in my career from there. And then fast forward, you know, many years working at Starbucks HQ, I I worked on the Veterans Hiring Initiative. And those folks certainly had the same mantra in just how they worked and how they lived. And it's really, really made a big impact on me from a leadership perspective. So from there, I spent time in startups. I worked at Microsoft. I co-founded Smartsheet, which went public in 2018. And for much of that, portion of my career, I was one of the few women in tech because this is sort of dot-com era and post, meaning through the bust and beyond. And went through a divorce and had to kind of reinvent myself. I would say personally and professionally, I had taken some time off to spend at home with my five young kids at the time. And reentering the workforce had a big impact on me because I thought wrongly, that I would have no problem coming back in. But I did have a tough time and folks wanted to understand what the gap was on my resume. And I think in overcoming that and ultimately landing at Starbucks HQ and learning how women are perceived after they have kids and research shows that we're perceived as less devoted to our work by men and women. And just looking at then the impact that has on wages, it caused me to really start thinking about the pay gap and what the pay gap means and what it is and how we can overcome it using things like innovation and technology. What was the part of the process of coming back into the workforce that was the most challenging for you? I think it was the interview process, honestly. Because I had so many experiences and skills, and quite frankly, skills I had also learned at home in raising kids and learning how to emotionally coach them and 
being able to balance so many different things and prioritize and all of that. And, and certainly those things were not taken into account. It was really a demerit to have spent that time at home. But even all of the experience prior to that, it almost felt like it was discounted. It almost felt like, oh, well, you did all that. Yeah, that's fine and good, but you took this time off. So now you're going to have to overcome the fact that you took this time off and everything you did before that is seen at a discount. So when I had left, I had co-founded Smartsheet. I was a VP of marketing. I had led marketing at earlier stage startups, had worked at Microsoft. And I realized that in order to get back in, I was going to have to go back in at a much lower level and then work my way back up. And luckily, I found a really open-minded hiring manager at Starbucks who saw some of the things that I had to offer and was willing to, quote, take a chance on me. And, And that's really what he was doing. And I think it was eye-opening to realize that someone was having to take a chance on me. I, I felt like at that point I had been proven, but I hadn't. I really had to reprove that I had the skills and capabilities to succeed in a Fortune 500 organization. What this speaks to for me is the value of mentorship. And that's at any point or all the points in your career Uh, not that you needed mentorship in terms of your skill development, but that you needed someone to advocate for you and recognize your value after you had this break in your employment history. What happened after you were hired? Once I got in, I think it started to get a lot better because of the organization I selected. So again, Starbucks is a very progressive organization. They're very aware of some of these topics. They're super transparent. One of the biggest projects I worked on was our very first announcement of pay equity. And it was Howard Schultz's last annual meeting prior to Kevin Johnson taking over. And we were committing to release the summary of results of our pay equity analysis before any other companies were doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think in that scenario, I ended up landing at a very, very good company for women, for moms, for parents, for caregivers. But the process in which I got there was very eye-opening. So what do we do about that? How do we make that better? Is it is it really just up to the kind of awareness and, and character of the people running the businesses? Is there – what else can we do other than try to raise awareness about this? Yeah, one of the things we can do I think is happening as a after effect of COVID in that there's more flexibility in the workplace. People are – more able to work flexible hours or sometimes from home. I think that's very beneficial. It's also taxing. So there's a hidden tax to that as well. But I do think that provided flexibility gives folks more opportunity. The other thing I've thought a lot about is much like Starbucks had this incredible program to hire veterans and help them transition into the corporate workforce, giving them credit for skills and experiences that they had in a very different environment on mm-hmm. the, the field of duty, could we do that for other types of experiences as well? It's not typical for a growth stage startup to enable people to do part-time work. And we've allowed several employees to flex between part-time and full-time as you know they have different responsibilities or caregiving status for a parent or for a kid. It appears you're working from home as we talk. Is your company operating mostly remotely at this point? We are. We're 100% remote. And we do have team gatherings that are really important. So every other year we do an all hands with the entire company. And every year we let the functional teams get together once or twice a year Mm -hmm. for a couple of days. And I think that's that's really critical. There's a bunch of other things that we do. And, and part of that, I, I really think some of this focus on culture is why we have a 94% retention rate in mm. 2021 and 93% retention rate in through 2022. Congratulations. Yeah. But thank yeah. you. And some of it's test and learn. Like we started these Free Think Fridays and all employees commit to a day with fewer meetings and they use that time to connect. So we book office spaces across the country where we have hubs of people, five or more. And it's one Friday a month and we encourage them to come in and we get them lunch and we try to make sure that there's no Zooms on that day. So they really can sort of ad hoc, just cross-functionally collaborate. We actually have someone in HR and her whole job is remote engagement. I I think there's a lot there that we invest in. We shut the company down for two weeks a year between Christmas and New Year's and then the July 4th week because 
we have flexible vacation policy, but what we found was for some personalities, and I'm one of these, I can't take time off because it gives me more stress and anxiety knowing things are piling up. Mm. So as the CEO, you know, I'm always kind of staying on top of it. But what I realize is it's not just me. I have a bunch of employees that have that same mindset. So the shutdowns were really a way to say, take a breather. Nothing's going to be piling up. You can all just take a breath and spend time with your families and recharge. And that has been tremendously successful. The tech industry is famous for putting in long hours. It just it has that reputation. I've always wondered how much of that is actually necessary to run those businesses effectively as how much is just a cultural norm that's been established? I have mixed feelings on this. I think it's a requirement in our industry. Is that good? I don't know. Is it sustainable? Is it sustainable? I don't know. But I know the pace at which our industry moves with competition, with innovation, with making sure your product's keeping pace, making sure your go-to-market is constantly changing with the environment. I would say the most important characteristic for someone to succeed in our business is adaptability. Can you be adaptable? Can you check and adjust? Can you realize that's how things were the last six months, but the next six months are going to be very different and we're going to change. We're going to be adaptable. It's, it's crucial if you're going to work in not only tech, but I would say in a startup, in a growth stage startup You've got to be able to to roll with it. Let's say you, you have a work environment in which some people are working in the office or some people go to the office more frequently and other people are home almost 100% of the time. Do you have any concerns about people being able to build the networks and the visibility and things they need to do to advance in the company if they're being compared with someone who's spending more time in the office than they are? Of course, you're 100% remote, so it, 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 it levels that out. But it's something I'm concerned about. There was a time right before Omicron, I think, that we were considering signing a sublease for Seattle because mm-hmm. we have about 40 employees here. We've got employees in New York, and then we have employees sort of all over the country and in Europe. And one of the things that came up from my CTO, who's out of New York and has been with the company longer than I have. And he's very strategic. And I would say if you ever had a CTO who could actually step into the role of CHRO, it would be this human. He's just Mm -hmm. very, very in tune with culture and the impact that culture has on people and also very in tune with things around principles of fairness and access and opportunity creation. And he said, how is that going to feel for folks knowing that three quarters of the leadership team is in Seattle and there's a handful of employees that will get access to those people every single day in person? Yes. And they'll get access to those drive-bys, the, the lunches, the, yep. you know, the after work stuff. And he said, it just doesn't feel like it matches the mission and values of our company. And so we didn't do it. And, and that's not to say we're never going to put offices back in the mix, but it's definitely something you have to think about. And you have to have a strategy and an approach to ensure you're keeping pulse on opportunities and who has access to opportunities. How does working remotely impact opportunities for advancement or just communication in general? We've been investing in management training and leadership training. We have a whole level of next level leaders of our company and are doing the types of training to help with this is that in a remote and online world, sometimes, and I think you've probably experienced this, I have certainly experienced this, you have tough feedback to give someone. Right. And in person, that conversation would absolutely occur. But when you're on a Zoom call, it's so easy to punt. It's so easy to say, well you know, we'll just figure it out next time, or it's a tough conversation. It's so awkward to have it over Zoom. And so I think what's happening is we've got this whole incoming layer of first-time managers, and we're not training them or giving them the skills to give that tough feedback over Zoom. So what happens is they get to the point where they need to put a performance improvement plan in place or, you know, something like that. And you ask the question, which is the best question to ask, is the person going to be surprised? Right. Right. And They say yes. And part of that, I think, goes back to you have to train and empower your teams to learn how to give that tough feedback in a hybrid and remote environment. 
Yeah. They, I mean, they, boy, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, a lot of companies are, are just simply even questioning the performance review process generally. And there's companies that have actually eliminated it. And I, I'm okay with that as long as the discipline within the management group is so strong about giving real-time feedback. I mean, feedback in the moment, observational feedback. Let's talk about that conversation that I just heard you have with a customer, or let's talk about the presentation you just made at the management meeting. And the problem, again, this is a structural problem, right? I think it, it, because we we pack feedback into this kind of formal process. And the person gets their nerves all steeled for that. They get very defensive going into those conversations. And, you know, what I've found over the years is the best time to give feedback is is just right there, right then and there in the moment. I guess a way to say it is I think it's a healthy organization when feedback isn't a big deal. It's how we roll. It's just what we do with each other every day. And, that, and then it becomes a cultural norm rather than a structural requirement from the HR department. I agree with that. 100%. So first, you have to educate that ongoing feedback is really important. Documenting that ongoing feedback is important. Acknowledging when someone takes the feedback and actually learns from it and shows that they've made progress against it. Also acknowledging when they're not taking the feedback. A lot of times what I see in early managers is they'll give the tough feedback, but then they really have a hard time following up the next time something occurs yeah. to have to tell the person again, because then it gets uncomfortable. You also, at the top, you've got to have a culture that sees failure as an opportunity to learn and sees perfect as not a thing. Like there's no perfect. There's only building confidence in learning when you fail and getting better and doing that over and over again so that when you succeed, you have the confidence that you know how you got there. And so if you if you start to build that, then people can be more okay with getting feedback here and there that's not positive because they understand the culture is we're going to help you learn from this and get better. Again, we move from the structural question into the into the cultural question. My wife and I just celebrated our 46th wedding anniversary, and I, I've described our 46 years together as one very long conversation. And And we learned a long time ago not to store stuff behind the dam and then have the dam break. Marcus Buckingham, who wrote the book Nine Lies About Work, says that employees don't want feedback. They want to be noticed. They want somebody to sit with them and treat them as a human being and show interest in them. And that's that in many ways is more important than giving them feedback, is noticing what they want to be in the world, what they want to try to accomplish, and helping them do that instead of just saying, I'm your boss, here's what I've observed, here's where you're screwing up and you need to get better. All this ties into a cultural question. And one of the aspects of culture is how we communicate with our employees and how transparent we are with them. Does Cindy have any official policies about transparency? We have a pretty strong commitment to transparency. So we've been posting salary ranges for every job probably a year before the first legislation even was on the table. Mm -hmm. We adjust ranges in internal salaries yearly. We report on our median pay gap and pay equity to Cindio employees. And we post that not only internally, but both, but publicly as well. Do you ever find yourself in situations where you're unable to be fully transparent? So we have kind of our Cindio mission and values and behaviors, and we try to keep those pretty active. So in every single all hands meetings, we start by by posting the mission and values and yeah, talking them good, through. It's a good practice. To I like keep that. them alive and to continuously be working on what are the behaviors that align to those. We, we have them in performance conversations and feedback. We use them as much as we can. So in the early days, one of the, the, mission or values, if you will, was transparency and trust. And during COVID, when COVID hit, I had to do a small layoff. I mean, at mm -hmm. the time it, it was about seven people, but it was, you know, we were only 25 people. So it was a right. pretty good chunk of our population. And what I realized is that I couldn't live up to the value of transparency because I was the CEO and there were people impacted that felt they should have like, ultimate transparency as to the plans. And in order to do 
a layoff with empathy, you have to time it to the minute. Yep. You have to ensure that the people impacted know immediately upon anyone else knowing right. so that so that it doesn't leak and they don't find out. And there's all these things to make it an experience that you do with the utmost integrity, even though it's a horrible experience. And so we changed the value. I actually said, I can't have the word be transparency because there are times in the business, you know, maybe conversations I have with the board or maybe conversations we have about that the comp committee has suggestions or requirements for us. I can't be 100% transparent all the time with everyone. So we changed mm -hmm. it to candor. And so now it's the candor trust loop, which is what we talk about. Be candid, be direct, be as clear as you can. Don't hide the ball. If you can't say something, just say, I can't yep. share this with you. Yep. But it was really important to me that we got the words right. I didn't feel like I could keep the promise of transparency. I feel like I can keep the promise of candor. That's an interesting distinction. Thank you for that. Yeah. What, What's your biggest challenge in the next couple of years as the CEO of your company? I don't mean to sound generic, but th the goalposts really changed in tech over the past eight months. And so if you think about being a post-Series C startup, it was all about growth. And now that has changed in a good way, I think. We are being required to think about efficient growth, to and think pro about profitability and profitability yeah, yeah, and your and, path yeah, to profitability. Yeah. So for us, what that means is looking at, you know, how much does it cost us to acquire a customer? And is that too much? And where's the duplication in our business? And how do we grow more efficiently? And have we gotten too swim laney? I mean, I know that's not a word, but you know, as you grow <laughs> and scale, you sort of create these tiny little boxes of specificity and roles. And I think what's happening is we're realizing, you know, we got to go back to being a little more broad where people can work cross-functionally, can be more, a little more agile and adaptable. And that's not to say like dump two jobs on a person, but I do think you've got to step back a little bit from that specificity around, you know, your job, it gets smaller and smaller and, and take that to be a little more broad in the name of efficiency and in the name of efficient growth and a path to profitability. I've done a lot of work with manufacturing businesses, especially aerospace here in, in Seattle. And I've also done quite a bit of work with professional service firms and tech companies. And the emphasis that you see on productivity in a manufacturing plant is not typically matched with an emphasis on productivity in a white collar settings. It's an interesting distinction because when somebody's operating a piece of equipment, we know exactly the dollar value of everything that was produced off of that machine or that that process. And in a professional services firm or a tech firm, it's more difficult, I think, to filter through those issues of waste and, and efficiency and things like but you need to, even if even if you're not manufacturing a physical product, you need to know where value is being generated. And at what rate? And is that is that sustainable? So that's a that's a real challenge for somebody running a tech company. How are we really making money? <laughs> yes. And how much is it costing us to right. make that money? Right. Yeah. Do you find your at VC partners getting more adamant about producing a bottom line? Is that is that what you're seeing happen? And, and that's why we're starting to see some of these layoffs that we're seeing is we don't really need to be doing that. That's not necessary for our mission. I think across the board, and you see it in the public stock valuations, you know, they're now being graded on not growth, but efficient growth. And yeah. I think it's the right call, honestly, you know. It's a maturing of the industry really is what it is. We couldn't continue on the path that we were on forever. I'm alarmed anytime I see, you know, no, news of 10, 18,000 people, whatever, you know, hundreds, over 100,000 people in the tech sector now recently. You're concerned about that. But on the other hand, it makes perfect sense, I guess, to me in some ways that this is happening. And you have to balance it with, you know, the companies that were smart during COVID, for example, Apple, they grew at a much more conservative pace and they're not doing thousands of layoffs. So mm -hmm. I think we just have to make sure we don't swing the pendulum too far in the direction of fear. If we're doing it because we're afraid and we're not doing it because we really are finding efficiencies in the business and ways to grow smarter, that's a problem because now you're just as bad as when you were, you know, in the frothy times, just assuming that we were always going to have free money and zero interest rates. Another thing that I see is, is often a person who's very entrepreneurial, very, very growth oriented, has difficulty making the transition 
into more of the management phase, which is how are we now going to stabilize this business? How are we going to make money in it? How are we going to make it sustainable? Is that an issue for you at all, moving from a, a more entrepreneurial phase to, okay, now we're going to look more at the how we make nickels and dimes rather than how we make millions? <laughs> Our original co-founders of Eigen, when I joined as CEO, he was doing everything. And so slowly but surely, he had to scale into the role of a founder. And that meant giving away thing after thing after thing. And so luckily, he's been very, very good at it. Mm. And we've had a great partnership as we've started to incorporate operationalizing the business. And at times, you know, he drives him crazy, drives me crazy as early stage entrepreneurs that things can't get done faster. I think that's where we really have invested in management training, in making sure that our people have the skills to grow as managers. Management is really difficult. It is a skill. It is a skill that's learned and practiced and honed. It's a craft. So I think if you are in an entrepreneurial early stage, you can get away without having that. Because again, everyone's doing everything. There's good communication. Everyone's one phone call away from the other person. But as you scale, you've got to invest in teaching your folks how to be good leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As a person in the leadership development field, you just gave my elevator pitch for me. We always say that people don't invest in leadership development during two phases of their company's development. One is when they're growing, and one is when they're not growing. <laughs> it's a, there's always an excuse to not invest in, in leadership development. One is when you're too busy, too much going on. We can't have people in a classroom. They need to be manning the phones and the computers. And the other is, oh, now we don't have the money for it, right? And, and unfortunately, there's companies that literally never do meaningful leadership development work because they're always in one of those two mindsets. And so, you know, good on you for investing in your people. I believe very strongly that none of us are in business just to make money or to build a widget. That we should be in business for a lot of other reasons as well. And one of them is, is developing the capacity and the, and the character and the competency of the people that work for us. One of my favorite questions to ask my clients is, would you bet a million dollars that your business will even exist in 50 years. And very few of them would be willing to bet anything close to that because most businesses don't last that long. So I asked them then, you know, what will your impact be 50 years from now? If your business no longer exists, what are you doing as a business right now that will have a beneficial impact on, on the world 50 years from now? And that changes the conversation that makes people more legacy focused and it makes people realize that as we help human beings and, and families and communities live better lives, that's something that'll last, that'll have an impact a hundred years from now and not just on next quarter's financial reports. And I think that's what a lot of the incoming folks want. They want purpose driven yes. work. And I agree. When people talk about Gen Z in this capacity, I find it fascinating because to me, it's not just Gen Z. It is now everyone coming out of a post-COVID environment. We really did look deeply at our commitments and where we spend our time and how we want to live our lives. And I think that is ubiquitous across humans. So this idea that that's going to be specific to Gen Z or the young folks I just, I think we have come out of this a very, very, with a very different perspective and mindset about what we want out of work. And I'm also experiencing the same thing within my circle of friends who are in their 60s and 70s, because we want, we want purpose and meaning as much as anybody, right? So you're right. It's not an age. It's not an age thing. I love the way that, that COVID forced us to ask those questions. We need to continue to ask those questions. And I think we're conducting an enormous experiment in social development as a culture in terms of what does this mean if more of us are working from home? What does this mean if we're, if we're running more equitable and diverse organizations? What does it mean as we strive to gain equity and fairness in everything we do? 
you know, that's so much more than just drawing a paycheck. So I appreciate that your company has that mission. And I'm not surprised that you're retaining people, frankly. They're, they're doing something really meaningful. Maria, before we end our conversation today, are there any leadership aha moments that you've had recently that you'd like to share? I think the one that's jumping out at me was from a leadership team meeting that we had last Thursday. And occasionally I'll ask the team to do icebreakers, which they all, you know, give me the eye roll. But for this one in particular, I had a really strong intent. And I asked them, what are the two characteristics over the next 12 to 18 months that we must embody as a leadership team to be a high performance team in what we now know is the presentation of the background macro environment for the next 12 to 18 months? And what are the two characteristics we should avoid at all costs as a leadership team over the next 12 to 18 months? Because again, in that sense of adaptability, these change constantly. The characteristics that that drive you to being a high performance team in times when everything's great and on the up and up are very different. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a beautiful moment, not because the answers were all consistent, but because I found that the leadership team was really looking at one another with curiosity. And it was real curiosity around, oh, that's so interesting that you said, you know, you think one of the, the characteristics we should avoid at all costs is blame or undermining one another. It was just this enlightening moment where they all got to see what are the triggers for one another and how do we all think about success in this environment? And it was it was cool. It could have been so cheesy and trite. And I feel like the way they answered, the way they came to the table and the way they then engaged in conversation was beautiful. So many management meetings are just a series of tactical questions and activities. And I think from a 21st century leadership skill is is facilitation. And I think when you ask a question like that, you're acting in the role of a facilitator. You're creating conversation. And that's a wonderful skill for a leader to have because really what one of the things a leader does is they raise they raise the awareness and, and even the IQ of their employees by challenging them by asking good questions. And that was a good one. We also talk about vision, right? We think of vision as like looking out five years. But sometimes you have to walk into a meeting with your employees and have a vision for yourself of how you're going to show up in that moment. What is my vision for this meeting? What is my vision for this conversation? What is my vision for this relationship? And I I like to take vision and kind of chunk it down into small pieces because I think if we if we approach each situation – with a desired outcome in mind, we're better off. So I love that. Keep, it, keep asking those kinds of questions. Those are those are great questions. So I want to say before we finish up here that I think your company, Cindio, is in very good hands. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is such a team effort what we're building, and you know it's a journey. So we just keep learning and improving along the way. I took over an organization. It wasn't a big one. It was about 36, 37 employees, I think. And the employees did not know (laughs) that in the 12 months prior to my arrival uh, on the job that the company had lost about $600,000 in net operating (laughs) income. And the first thing I did was tell them. And I did so against the wishes of the the owner of the company who who felt that employees couldn't handle the truth that they would they would flee they would freak out you know if they knew that the the business was in such dire straits and it was fascinating for me how quickly behavior changed it literally changed that day in that organization because all of a sudden everybody was taking ownership so i you know partly because of that experience and a lot of other things i've observed over the years i'm just a big fan of transparency i think you should be transparent about a lot of things uh, including the company's financial performance, uh, including pay equity issues. Uh, people should know what the ranges are for their uh, salary ranges are for their position. They should know what the salary ranges are for the other positions they might aspire to in the organization. They should know if the company's considering big changes in structure or strategy. When people know the truth, they can take more uh, responsibility for uh, addressing the truth and dealing with the truth. You can't create accountability in your organization if you aren't telling people what they need to know 
and and you can't get mad at them for not taking more action or more or being more assertive if if they don't know what it is the 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 consequences and the significance of what it is they're you're asking them to work on and part of transparency is to get higher levels of performance out of your employees because they will take more ownership if they know more about what's going on. There's a, there's a patriarchal component to not being transparent. It, it, it's, it, it, you're dishonoring your employees when you think they can't handle the truth. You're dishonoring employees when you don't think they're mature enough or intelligent enough to process even somewhat complex information about the business. I really challenge all of you to think about uh, transparency as a, as a critical value for your business. This is what Maria's company is, is helping other companies move towards, and I, I honor that work and uh, ask you all to consider ways to honor your employees by sharing more information with them rather than less. Well, thank you for listening to Path Forward, Real Conversations About Leadership. If you enjoyed this episode, really appreciate it if you let us know. You can rate and review the show on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. Special thanks to all my guests for the level of vulnerability they took in sharing their stories. If you'd like to be a guest on Path Forward, please reach out via the contact form on my website, pathforwardleadership.com. That's also where you can learn more about our show, my upcoming book, and my leadership services. This episode is produced by Large Media. You can find them at larjmedia.com. As always, thank you for listening. I'm Jim Hessler, and this is Path Forward.